The StatQuest introduction to PyTorch is here. StatQuest. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to StatQuest. Today we're going to talk about the StatQuest introduction to PyTorch. This StatQuest is sponsored by Lightning and Grid.ai. Lightning and Grid are awesome. You can do cool stuff in the cloud. Hooray! Note, this StatQuest assumes that you already understand the main ideas behind neural networks, the main ideas behind how neural networks are fit to data with backpropagation, the main ideas behind the ReLU activation function, and how tensors are used in neural networks. If not, check out the quests. Lastly, you can download all of the code in this stack quest for free. The details are in the pinned comment below. In Neural Networks Part 3, the ReLU activation function in action, we started with a simple data set that showed whether or not different drug doses were effective against a virus. The low and high doses were not effective but the medium dose was effective. Then we talked about how this neural network used weights and biases to slice, flip, and stretch the ReLU activation functions into new and exciting shapes to fit this pointy thing to the dataset. Bam. Hey look, it's StatSquatch. Hey Josh, this neural network is awesome. Can we code it in PyTorch? Yes, however, before we start coding, let's label the weights and the biases. Now we need to make sure we have the necessary Python modules installed. In this tutorial, we will be using PyTorch to create the neural network and matplotlib and seaborn to draw awesome graphs. If you need help installing any of these, check the pinned comment below. Now that we have installed everything that we'll need to implement this neural network, let's get coding. The first thing we do is import the Python modules that we will use. First, we'll import PyTorch, which is actually called Torch because that is what it was originally called before it was ported to Python. We'll use Torch to create tensors to store all of the numerical values, including the raw data, and the values for each weight and bias. Then we will import torch.nn, which we will use to make the weight and bias tensors part of the neural network. Then we import torch.nn.functional, which gives us the activation functions. Then we import sgd, which is short for stochastic gradient descent, to fit the neural network to the data. The next two things we import, matplotlib and seaborn, are all just to draw nice looking graphs. Note, the Seaborn package is traditionally imported as SNS, which stands for Samuel Norman Seaborn, a fictional character in the drama The West Wing. The dude that wrote Seaborn is just a big fan of The West Wing and names his stuff after it. Strange but true, bam. Now let's build this neural network. With PyTorch, creating a new neural network means creating a new class. So we start by creating a new class that, in this example, we call BasicNN. And BasicNN will inherit from a PyTorch class called Module. Now we create an initialization method for the new class. And the first thing we do is call the initialization method for the parent class, NN.module. Then we initialize the weights and biases in our neural network. We'll start with weight W sub 0, 0, which is set to 1.70. So we create a new variable called W00 and make it a neural network parameter. Making this weight a parameter for the neural network gives us the option to optimize it. Now, since weight W sub 0, 0 is 1.70, we initialize the new parameter with a tensor set to 1.7. Note, since this is a tensor, the neural network can take advantage of the accelerated arithmetic and automatic differentiation that it provides. Lastly, because we don't need to optimize this weight, we'll set requires underscore grad, 
which is short for requires gradient, to false. Likewise, we create new variables for the bias b sub 0 0 and the weight w sub 0 1. And then we create variables for the remaining weights and biases. Bam! We have created neural network parameters for each weight and bias. Now we need to connect them to the input, the activation functions, and, ultimately, to the output. In other words, we need a way to make a forward pass through the neural network that uses the weights and biases that we just initialized. So we do that by creating a second method inside basic NN called forward. So we can see what's going on, let's move the code for forward to the top of the screen. Now, the first thing we want to do is connect the input to the activation function on top. So we create a new variable, input to top rel u, that is equal to the input times the weight w sub 0 0 plus the bias b sub 0 0. Then we pass input to top rel u to the rel u activation function with f dot rel u. Psst, remember, Earlier, we imported torch.nn.functional as f, so that is where the ReLU function comes from. Then we save the output of the ReLU in top ReLU output. Now we scale top ReLU output by the weight w sub 0 1 and save the result in scaled top ReLU output. Likewise, we connect the input to the bottom ReLU and scale the activation function's output. Then we add the top and bottom scaled values to the final bias, and use the sum as the input to the final ReLU to get the output value. Lastly, the forward function returns the output. Thus, given an input value, the forward function does a forward pass through the neural network to calculate and return the output value. Bam! Now, if we look at the entire class that we created, basic NN, we see two methods, init and forward. Init creates and initializes the weights and biases. And forward does a forward pass through the neural network by taking an input value and calculating the output value with the weights, biases, and activation functions. Wow, this is a lot of code. How do we know it works and doesn't have any bugs? Good question, Squatch. We can verify that the code works by plugging in a bunch of values between 0 and 1 that represent different doses, and see if the output from forward results in this bent shape that fits the training data. So the first thing we need to do is create a sequence of input doses. And we do that with this command. Here, we use the PyTorch function, LenSpace, to create a tensor with a sequence of 11 values between and including 0 and 1. And we store the tensor in a variable called input doses. Note, we can print out and admire the input doses by just typing the variable name input doses. Now, the idea is to run these input values through our neural network. So we'll make a neural network that we'll call model from the class we just created, basic NN. Note, we are naming the actual neural network model because that is the standard variable name used when coding with PyTorch. Thus, from here on out, I'm going to use the term model and neural network interchangeably. If this freaks you out, check out the stack quest on models. Anyway, now we can pass the input doses to the model, which, by default, calls the forward method that we wrote earlier. And we save the output from the neural network in a variable we cleverly named output values. And now that we have both the input values to the neural network and the output values, we can use them to draw this graph that has different drug doses on the x-axis and their predicted effectiveness on the y-axis. First, we set the Seaborn style to white grid so the graph looks cool. And then we use line plot to draw a graph of the data. On the x-axis, we put the original input doses. 
and on the y-axis we put the corresponding output values. And then we make the line green and wide enough to easily see. Lastly, we set the y and x-axis labels. And that code gives us this graph. The graph tells us that the neural network we created earlier, basic NN, does exactly what we expected. In other words, Earlier, we showed that when we put input values between 0 and 1 into this neural network, the output was this bent shape, which is the same as the graph we drew with our code. Double BAM! Now that we can create a neural network in PyTorch and graph what it can do, can we pretend that we don't already know the optimal value for B subfinal is negative 16? Sure thing, Squatch. We'll just set B sub final to zero. And we can now use PyTorch to optimize B sub final with backpropagation. The first thing we'll do is make a copy of the original class we created, Basic NN, and change the name of the copy from Basic NN to Basic NN underscore train, because we want to train this neural network. Then we change the initial value for final bias to 0.0, .0 and we set requires underscore grad, which, remember, is short for requires gradient, to true. Setting requires grad to true is what tells PyTorch that this parameter should be optimized. We can verify that setting B sub final to zero results in a neural network that no longer fits the training data by drawing a graph of the neural network's output like we did before. Only this time, we create the model from basic NN underscore train instead of basic NN. And because final underscore bias now has a gradient, we call detach on the output values to create a new tensor that only has the values. In other words, because Seaborn doesn't know what to do with the gradient, we strip it off with detach. The original graph we drew for basic NN shows effectiveness equals 1 when the dose equals 0.5, which is correct. In contrast, the graph for basic NN underscore train shows effectiveness equals 17 when dose equals 0.5, which is way too high. And that means we need to train the neural network to optimize B subfinal, which means we need to create this training data. All we have to do to create training data is create one tensor called inputs with the three input doses, 0, 0 0.5, and 1, and another tensor called labels that has the observed output values, 0, 1, and 0. Now we are ready to optimize the last bias, B sub final. Unfortunately, this next step requires a lot of code. But don't worry. We'll go through it one step at a time. Also, spoiler alert, later in this series on how to implement neural networks, we'll see how PyTorch Lightning makes this code a lot simpler. Anyway, the first thing we do is create an optimizer object that will use stochastic gradient descent, SGD, to optimize B subfinal. Psst, remember, we imported the SGD class from the torch.optim package way back at the start. So, in order to optimize B subfinal, we pass model.parameters to SGD, which will optimize every parameter that we set requires grad equal to true. We also set the learning rate to 0.1. In a bit, we're going to use our new optimizer to optimize final bias. But first, just so we can see how gradient descent improves the value for final bias, we'll print the current value. Psst. The stir function converts the tensor value into a string so we can print it with other text. And now we are ready to code the for loop that does gradient descent. Note, if you're not already familiar with gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent, check out the quests. Oh no, it's the dreaded terminology alert. Each time our optimization code sees all of the training data is called an epoch. So, in this example, every time we run all three points from our training data through the model, we call that an 
epoch. Thus, we start our optimization code with a for loop that counts the number of epochs. And we set it so that we will run all three data points from the training data through the model up to 100 times. Now we create and initialize a variable called total loss that will store the loss, which is a measure of how well the model fits the data. For example, if our unoptimized model fit the training data really poorly like this, and we had this really large residual, the difference between what the model predicts and what we know is true, then the loss would be relatively large. In contrast, if the model fit the training data a little better, and we had a smaller residual, then the loss would be relatively small. Thus, for each epoch, we will use total loss to keep track of how well the model fits the data. Now we start a nested for loop that runs each data point from the training data through the model and calculates the total loss. In this case, that means the for loop starts with the first point in the training data and determines its input or dose and its known label or effectiveness. Then it runs that dose through the model to get a predicted output. And then we calculate the loss between the predicted value and the known label with a loss function. In this case, we are calculating the squared residual, where the residual is the difference between the output and the known value. That said, you can code any loss function that you want to use, like the absolute value loss, or you can choose from among the many loss functions, like MSE loss or cross entropy loss, that come with PyTorch. Anyways, in this example, the predicted and known value for the first point is zero. So the squared residual is zero minus zero squared, which equals zero. Now we use loss.backward to calculate the derivative of the loss function with respect to the parameter or parameters we want to optimize. In this example, that means calculating the derivative of the squared residual with respect to B subfinal and plugging in the predicted and known values. Note, if any of this part is freaking you out, check out the StatQuest on backpropagation. Lastly, we add the squared residual to total loss, so we can keep track of how well the model fits all of the data. Now we go back to the start of the nested for loop and select the input and label for the second point in the training data set. And then we run the second point through the model to get a predicted output. And then we calculate the loss, the squared residual between the predicted and observed values. Next, we use loss.backward to calculate the derivative of the loss function with respect to B subfinal and, and this is really important, loss.backward adds that to the previous derivative. In other words, loss.backward remembers the derivative that we calculated for the first point and adds the new derivative that we calculated for the second point. Thus, loss.backwards accumulates the derivatives each time we go through the nested loop. To be honest, the first time I saw this, it blew my mind. This is because every time we go through the nested loop, we create a brand new loss variable here and I couldn't figure out how the new loss could add to what the last one computed. However, it turns out that we create loss from the output value, which in turn comes from the model, and the model keeps track of the derivatives. Anyway, the main point is that loss.backward accumulates the derivatives each time we go through the nested loop, and we need to keep this in mind. In contrast, total loss does not automatically accumulate, so we add the new squared residual to total loss. Then we go through the loop one last time for the last point in the training data set. And that means we calculate the squared residual for the last point. And when we call loss.backward, we add the derivative for the last point to the other two derivatives. And lastly, we add the squared residual to total loss. Bam, we made it through the nested loop. And now that we're done with the nested loop, we check to see if total loss is really small. 
If so, that means the model fits the training data really well and we can stop training. So, if total loss is really small, we print out the number of epochs we've gone through so far and break out of the optimization loop to stop training. Otherwise, if total loss is not small, then we take a small step towards a better value for B subfinal using optimizer.step. Note, just like loss has access to the derivatives in the model when we call loss.backward, optimizer.step also has access to the derivatives stored in model and can use them to step in the correct direction. Now we need to zero out the derivatives that we're storing in model, and we do that with optimizer.zero.grad. Note, if we don't zero out the derivatives, then the next time we enter this nested loop and call loss.backward, we'll add the new derivatives to the old derivatives from the previous step. And that would be bad. Lastly, we print out the current epoch and the current value for final bias, so we can see how final bias changes each time through the loop. Now we've made it through the entire optimization loop, and we just repeat it until total loss is small or we go through 100 epochs. Anyway, now that we have gone through the optimization loop, we print out the final value for the final bias. Bam! Now, when we run this block of code, we see the value for final bias before we optimize, zero, and that value, as we saw before, gives us this graph of the output. Then we see the values that final bias takes on during each step of gradient descent. And after 34 steps, the total loss is tiny. And the optimal value for final bias is negative 16.0019, which is pretty close to negative 16, the optimal value we used originally. Hey, can we draw one last graph to verify that the optimized model fits the training data? Sure thing, Squatch. We can verify that the optimized model fits the training data by graphing it with this code, which is the same as what we used before, except now we don't create a new model. Instead, we just use the one we optimized. And this is what we get, which shows that the neural network does exactly what we expect. Triple BAM! Now it's time for some shameless self-promotion. If you want to review statistics and machine learning offline, check out the StatQuest study guides at statquest.org. There's something for everyone. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting StatQuest. If you like this StatQuest and want to see more, please subscribe. And if you want to support StatQuest, consider contributing to my Patreon campaign, becoming a channel member, buying one or two of my original songs or a t-shirt or a hoodie, or just donate. The links are in the description below. Alright, until next time, quest on!